Would you join me as I pray? Father, we love you and we recognize your presence. We simply acknowledge your power, your love, your forgiveness, and your grace. God, we thank you for the opportunity to navigate the rain so that we can be at church. God, we are here for you. We want to experience your presence in a real and powerful way this morning. And everybody said, amen, amen, and amen. Hey, grab a seat. Grab a seat. My name is uh, my name's Casey, and um, together with my wife, we are the lead pastors of the Refinery Church. And um, each and every one of you deserves a round of applause. I know churches in Southern California that canceled church today because of the rain. So give yourselves a round of applause. Come on. Come on. Hey, um, if I could get one of our team members to bring up a music stand, that would be helpful. Uh, hey, I want to acknowledge something real quick. Today, uh, in, in just, uh, just like, man, 13 days from now, it's going to be Christmas Eve. We're excited about Christmas Eve. Thanks, Tony. Uh, we're excited about Christmas Eve, and we are uh, taking the risk to do two services to create more space for you, your family, and all the things. Um, and so today, uh, on your way out, we want to bless you with a six-pack, okay? Um, and that's what we're calling these little invitation packs. Uh, there are six invitation cards that are the size of a business card, so it's easily transferable, uh, easily portable. You could put it in your pocket. You could put some in your wallet. You could put them in your purse. Uh, you could put them in your fanny pack, for all I care, okay? Um, but we want you to be thinking, we want you to be praying for who it is that you're supposed to be inviting, and we want to encourage you, we want to challenge you to take this six-pack and hand out all six invitation cards over the next 13 days. Uh, they're back here on the back table. We moved everything inside so we don't die from the rain. So you can pick up these. Uh, you don't have to check them out. They're free of charge, of course, and they're there for you. So this is my six-pack. And um, I will do some inviting uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks. We, uh, I just want to, I, I just want to acknowledge a couple of things. First of all, um, I normally get up here and I, I, I greet our guests. I'm like, man, we are so thankful for those of you who chose to uh, join us today. We recognize that it requires a bunch of courage to come, and so, so uh, on behalf of our team to you, those of you who are our guests, thank you for. Uh, taking the risk and joining us this morning. Okay, so thank you for those of you who are our guests. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge, man, we have a team of people who have been faithful and are being faithful. Some of you are new, uh, but man, you show up, uh, you are giving, you are uh, serving, and you are inviting, and it's because of your faithfulness that allows us to continue to make a meaningful difference uh, both right here and in our community. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and thank you, okay? Uh, again, uh, we, uh, my name is Casey, and we are in a series right now uh, called The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And um, uh, the reason we're calling this The Good, The Bad, The Ugly is because as we read through the Bible, what we're discovering is that rather than cleaning up the lives of its heroes, the Bible tends to do the opposite. In fact, highlighting some of the, the failures, the imperfections and sins in the lives of its heroes. And, and, and it's as if uh, the Bible is trying to remind us that no matter how big or how small our sin and mistakes are, uh, they do not disqualify us from God's love, okay? And so, so far in this series, uh, what we've done and what we've said is that God has made each and every one of us unique on purpose. And the reason he's done that is so that we can fulfill our purpose. And so, rather than making decisions based upon what others might think or feel, we can make decisions based on our God-given uniqueness and to follow after God's leadership, okay? And so, and then last week, Michael, our guest from Real Life in Valencia, he did a great job as we looked at the first half of King David's life, and we learned that God's goal is to develop our character before he loads on 
uh, the responsibility of our God-given calling, okay? And this week what we're going to do is we're going to look at David's life again, the, the second king of Israel. Uh, and, and what we're going to watch is, is David, David's life actually takes a turn for the worst. And we're going to look at uh, a, 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 a situation, a season where David makes some of the ugliest decisions uh, in his life and in his leadership uh, over Israel. And so uh, if you brought your Bible, what you can do is you can turn there. Uh, if you have a Bible app, you can turn to 2 Samuel uh, and, the, and the story picks up in chapter 11, verse 1. And so I got, we got some work to do before we get there, uh, but that's where we're going to land here in a few moments. Uh, let me pray and uh, invite God's leadership and influence uh, to be here uh, so I don't run church, okay? Uh, Father, we love you, and uh, God, we came to hear your voice. We did not come to hear a man. God, so we ask that you would take the Bible, the scriptures, and you would take the black and white words and that you would transform it to be alive and, uh, and, um, and well in our lives. God, we want to be more like Jesus when we leave here today than we were when we showed up. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 How many of you are uh, good gift givers? Okay, raise your hand. Yeah, it's cool. Okay, a couple of you. Wow, we're a terrible church. Okay. <laughs> right, the good gift givers, um, they are thoughtful. They're paying attention to what people are saying they want for months before it's time to get them a present, right? So if it's like, it's your birthday, then for months, they're listening and you don't even know it, right? And of course, it's Christmas. And so all, you know, since August, they've been like, okay, what is it they want, you know? And, and, and you write your list and what you really want isn't even on, on their list, but those good gift givers, they know what you want, right? In fact, it's those good gift givers that when you do a secret Santa, you want them to draw your name so they get you a present, right? Okay, how many of you are, are not very good at gift giving, okay? All right, so, uh, so you, like, he, like I'm, I'm in the bad gift giving, like, sphere, right? So for me, I need a specific list and I need specific links. Otherwise, I'm going to ruin your Christmas, okay? <laughs> Case in point. A few years after uh, we got married, Amy and I got married, we were talking about getting a brand new set of pots and pans, okay? And so we're at the store, and we both found a set of pots and pans that we liked. And, um, and, and she liked the orange, uh, feminine-shaped pots and pans by Rachel Ray, and I liked the black kind of clean lines, uh, pots and pans with a little bit of orange, you know, highlights, okay? And uh, we couldn't, we didn't make the purchase that, that afternoon because we couldn't agree on which set of pots and pans uh, to purchase. You guys know where this is going, huh? So fast forward a couple months to Christmas time, and now this was so long ago, long in my past, okay? I knew the perfect gift to get Amy uh, a new set of pots and pans. And so I purchased and I wrapped the pots and pans uh, and couldn't wait for her to open these brand new pots and pans on Christmas morning so I could start experimenting on brand new uh, recipes that I was learning on the Food Network. And so the moment came. We're exchanging gifts right there in our living room. And it was just her and I at the time. It was before we had kids. And as a proud and excited husband, I went and got that massive rectangle box behind the tree so that she could open uh, her box full of dreams. <laughs> but as she opened it, I could tell that I was more excited about the gift than she was. In fact, her smiling face turned into something less than happy <laughs> as she opened up the pots and pans that I really liked <laughs> instead of the pots and pans she 
really liked. I made two mistakes that Christmas. I got my wife pots and pans for Christmas. <laughs> Gentlemen, unless your wife says, I want pots and pans for Christmas, don't get your wife pots and pans for Christmas. My second mistake was I got her a gift for me instead of getting her a gift for her. Now, even as I share my testimony with you this morning, some of you are thinking, oh, crap, I got some exchanging and returning to do, <laughs> right? We've all made mistakes in our lives. In fact, we'll continue to make mistakes in our lives, and it's easy to look at my mistake and, and laugh, right, and laugh it off. But the truth is some of our mistakes can't be laughed off. Right? Some of our mistakes have caused tremendous amounts of pain in both our own lives and in the lives of others. Some of our mistakes have caused uh, friendships to fall apart, uh, marriages to experience divorce, and families to split. Some of our mistakes are the reason we lost a job. Uh, it's the, s some of our mistakes were the reason we had to file for bankruptcy or lose a house to foreclosure. Some of our mistakes, they didn't just happen once or twice or three times, but some of our mistakes are actually happening over and over again, and they're causing lasting wounds in the lives of the people that we value the most. In fact, just this past week, I was in a coffee shop. I go to the press because they have the best coffee in town. And there I am running into one of my friends whose son is uh, falling uh, back into his addiction. And he doesn't know where his son is, but he knows what his son is doing, right? We've all made mistakes and we'll keep making mistakes as long as we're human. But the term mistake is just one way to describe our failures. The Bible uses the term sin to describe when we miss the mark in our lives and in our relationship. Listen, the Bible has a lot to say about sin, but the most important, uh, but it's the most, but the most important thing to know about sin is that when we sin, both big and small, it actually creates pain and disconnect in our relationship with people and in our relationship with God. And I created pain and relation, relational disconnect when I selfishly went out and bought the pots and pans that I liked for my wife. And because relationships are the most important thing to God, sin is a really big deal. Okay? Sin is a really big deal. This morning, we're going to take a look at a series of really ugly decisions that David made. These sins, these failures, and these mistakes are the kind of mistakes that can't be laughed off. They can't be ignored. And my hope for us as, as we look at this case study this morning is that we're both encouraged and warned. I want each of us to be encouraged this morning and recognize that no matter how big or how long our sin patterns have been in our lives, our sin does not disqualify us from God's love. Be encouraged this morning. But I also want you to be warned because though God forgives our sin big and small, the consequences of our sin do not magically disappear. Okay? So, 2 Samuel, I got a new Bible today. Or not, not today, but last week, and I'm really excited because I uh, ruined my last Bible. Uh, th this morning, we're going to be in 2 Samuel. Uh, if you're following along in the story, uh, this week you would have re read chapter 12, and next week you'll read chapter 13, okay? Somebody yelled at me, and I got in trouble. Hey, you need to tell us where we need to I didn't really get in trouble, uh, but Tony did yell at me. <laughs> Just kidding. He didn't. He was kind. Here's the story. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, it says this, In the spring, at the time when kings are supposed to go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David 
remained in Jerusalem. In other words, he was supposed to be uh, at war with his men, but instead he omitted responsibility and he stayed home. One evening, David got up from his bed and, and he walked around on the roof of the place, of, of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she's Bathsheba, the, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Uh, then she went back home. Verse 5, the woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Now, there are three people in this uh, passage that I want to bring our attention to. Number one is King David, right? He's the second king of Israel. And up to this point, his campaigns and his life has been very, very successful. Then you have Bathsheba, who is both a beautiful woman and a married woman, okay? Uh, and then thirdly, we have Uriah. And this is uh, the husband of Bathsheba and one of David's best friends and most trusted and skilled soldiers. From a distance, David may not have known the identity of Bathsheba, but once he was told that the naked woman was Uriah's wife, he would have, had, he would have known exactly who Bathsheba was. Uriah and David had been friends and co-soldiers all the way back to the point even when Saul was the king of Israel. Uriah is uh, one of David's 30 mighty men, the Bible says. It would not have been, uh, it's not too much to assume that David was uh, 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 attended and celebrated Uriah and Bathsheba's wedding. Now, Bathsheba was no stranger to David. He knew who Bathsheba was. And of course, we know that there's more to this story because the passage that we've read leaves off with this, this news that Bathsheba is now pregnant. And the odd detail that we get about Bathsheba purifying herself from her monthly uh, menstrual cycle leaves no doubt uh, to any of us that the pregnancy is actually a result of this intended one night stand. And so here's how David uh, chooses to respond to the news of this unwanted pregnancy. Uh, chat, verse 6, it says this, So David sent word to Joab. He said, Send me Uriah the Hittite. Okay, remember, Uriah is off fighting the war that David is also supposed to be fighting. Uh, and Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him, Hey, uh, how... how uh, Hey, uh, how's Joab and how are the soldiers and how's the war going? And then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace with all of the master's servants and did not go down to his house. Now, David knows that once uh, Bats the timing of Bathsheba's pregnancy uh, it becomes public, people, including Uriah, will realize that this is not Uriah's child because Uriah is off fighting the king's war. So David, in an effort to hide his sin, he creates this plan to get Uriah to come home from the battlefield and sleep with Bathsheba. And if all of this works out according to plan, David can move on like nothing ever happened and he can avoid paying child support. <laughs> the only problem is that Uriah is a man of integrity. And when, when these men, they go off to battle, they make an oath that says, I will remain abstinent until the campaign has come to a completion. And so it's possible that David's suggestion uh, for Uriah to go wash his feet 
is, uh, refers to this ritual that would release Uriah from this abstinence oath. But Uriah, he honors his commitment and he honors those who are fighting the king's war. And so after a, another failed attempt, the next night, David comes up with, again, another plan. David writes this letter to the commander of Israel's army, Joab, and, um, and telling, him to, uh, telling him to put Uriah at the front lines of the war where he would uh, be surely killed by the enemy. And so Uriah uh, unknowingly takes King David's letter and delivers his own death notice to Joab and Uriah shortly thereafter is killed by the enemies. And they, then, of course, David quickly marries Bathsheba in an effort to keep uh, his sin a secret and lead people to believe that uh, Bathsheba's pregnancy is legitimate. Are you getting the picture? This is a mess. And I've seen enough true crime documentaries to know that some of you are just kidding. And so for a while, it seems as though David had successfully kept his sin under wraps, hidden, and escaped the consequences of his affair with Bathsheba and the murder of his friend Uriah. But then uh, the Bible tells us that there's this word of knowledge that's been revealed to a prophet named Nat Nathaniel, and Nathaniel then confronts David about a sin. Now, just a word uh, on a word of knowledge. A word of knowledge is, um, is, is information about a person or a situation that God reveals and you could know uh, this information in no other way. And when this happens, we don't use this information as a weapon and we don't use this information to manipulate somebody to do something that we want them to do. We, we use this information uh, at the right time and at the right place and with the right words to graciously remind that person of God's love. And that's exactly what Nathaniel, uh, I'm sorry, Nathan does. And so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about these miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, I want to encourage you to read chapters 11 through 14 in the New Testament uh, book of the Bible called 1 Corinthians. And so it's through this word of knowledge that God tells uh, Nathan about David's affair with Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah. And so uh, at the right time and in the right place and with the right words, Nathan addresses this with David. And in that moment, without making any excuses for his sin, David takes full responsibility for his sin. And later on, as David reflects on uh, his actions, his decisions, and of course his failures and sins, uh, David writes this beautiful poem of confession that's recorded for us in the Bible. And I want to read you just a couple of verses. It's called Psalm 51. And here's what David writes in his journal. It says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, he says, Blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. This is two verses of this confessional poem that's 19 verses long. God knows, listen, God knows that we will break his rules. And God has graciously given us a set of rules and uh, guidelines to help you and I have meaningful relationships with one another and with God. And it breaks his heart when we break his rules, but it doesn't prevent God from giving us the greatest gift he can give us, forgiveness, forgiveness. But we can only receive God's forgiveness if we acknowledge what we've done and refuse to rationalize our way out of it. Okay? 
One of the most beautiful promises in the entire Bible it says, if we, confess with, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Listen, God is more interested in how we respond to our failures and sins than punishing us for disobeying. He wants to know what's in your heart. Are we humble? Are we teachable? Are we willing to take responsibility? Or are we going to be prideful and make excuses and pretend like we're victims of situations and circumstances? Despite his horrendously sinful behavior, David realizes that he had sinned and he had sinned most towards God. If you uh, fast forward to the New Testament uh, book of the Bible called Hebrews, there's a list of names referred to often by churches and followers of Jesus called the Hall of Faith. And there's a list of these beautiful, like, strong, the heroes of the Bible. And guess whose name is right in the middle of that list? David's. There's no asterisk next to his name with a footnote that says, but not counting his sinful and immoral behavior. What David did was ugly, it was so perverse, it was so deceitful that you and I would expect that David's name was on some other list, maybe the hall of shame, but it's not. It's not. David's not remembered for the moral meltdown in the middle of his life. David is known for his passion for God and his willingness to take responsibility for his own behavior. I don't know what kind of sin you're carrying this morning. I don't know. Maybe it's small. Maybe you're like, man, I'm a little too lazy. Man, I eat a little too much. Maybe you said something to your wife. Or you exasperated your children. I'm guilty of that at times. But maybe it's a big thing. Maybe you're in a secret relationship. Maybe it's just emotional. Or maybe it's just online. Maybe it's a full-fledged affair. Listen. God loves you. Take responsibility. There is forgiveness. There is grace. You have not disqualified yourself from God's love. But you've got to come clean. Whatever it is, whatever you've said, God's forgiveness is bigger and stronger than your sin, and you have not disqualified yourself to God's love. I want to read this beautiful promise from Romans chapter 8. I want you to picture your sin for a moment. Everybody in here has it. It might be one thing. It might be like 73 things. I have no idea. But I want, you, I want you to receive what I'm about to. I'm going to read this over you. I don't want you to listen with your head. I want you to listen with your heart. Listen to this. Who could ever divorce us from the endless love of God's anointed one? Absolutely no one. For nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love towards us. Troubles, pressures, and problems are unable to come between us and heaven's love. What about persecutions, deprivations, danger, and even death threats? No, for they are all impotent to hinder the omnipotent love. So now I live with the confidence that there is nothing in the universe with the power to separate us from God's love. I'm convinced that his love will triumph over death, life's troubles, fallen angels or dark rulers in the heavens. There is nothing in our present or our future circumstances that can weaken God's love. There is no power above us or beneath us, no power that could ever be found in the universe that could distance us from God's passionate love, which is lavished upon us through our Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one. Man. That comes from the Passion Translation of the Bible, and that is just beautifully said. And that's for you. Man, that's for me. I need that. 
My kids need that. Your kids need that. Man, can I just, can I, this isn't in my notes, but wouldn't it be amazing for your kids to grow up and say, man, I was an idiot growing up, but my parents loved me like that. <sighs> That's how God loves you. That's how God loves you. Man. So before I give us some things that we can, uh, that I think will help us overcome sin and temptation in our life, I want to point out one more reality uh, that we learn from David's life, and it's this. The tragic truth about sin is that it has consequences. So God's forgiveness, he, he, it, it restores our relationship with God, but it doesn't erase the consequences of our actions. And if you look at David's life, you'll see that everything up until his affair with Bathsheba is going really well. Things at work is going well. Things in the kingdom are going really well. His family looks really good, and, and his personal life is all put together. But then this turning point happens, and everything seems to fall apart in his personal life. The baby that's the result of the affair dies. His daughter is raped by one of his sons. Another son, Absalom, rebels against him and tries to take his throne. Then that same son followed, uh, dies and followed by another attempt um, to, to steal the throne. The nation continues to, ex uh, to succeed, but his affair with Bathsheba is a turning point in his personal life. Just because someone is successful at work doesn't mean they're successful in, in life. Some of you have misdirected your anger towards God or maybe your doubt towards God because he's forgiven your sin, but he has not removed your consequences. Look, let me pastor you for a moment. You don't need your consequences to go away. You need wisdom to navigate through those trials and tribulations. And the promise of the scripture in James, the brother of Jesus, he says, man, if you need wisdom, you ask God who will pour out wisdom like never before. You and I need God's wisdom to walk with dignity and grace and honor and take responsibility. David could have been bitter and angry at God because he didn't step in and prevent him from having to deal with these consequences, but he wasn't. Instead, he faced these consequences of his sin with great dignity. In fact, at the end of his life, he's known to be a man after God's own heart. Right? right? You are not defined by your sin. You are not defined by your sin. Look at your neighbor and say, you are not defined by your failures. You are not defined by your failures. We'll never be perfect. For as long as we live, we're going to make some mistakes. But with God's help, our mistakes will get smaller and less frequent. Amen? Amen. The, yeah. Yeah. We can't be mistake-free, but I want to give you a few things that we can do to safeguard, safeguard our life from falling into temptation and sin. The first is this. Uh, this is where you should take notes, okay? So open up your notes app or a journal, and I'm going to give you three things that I think is going to be really, really helpful. Number one is this. Be alert. Be alert. First Peter uh, chapter 5 says, Be alert and sober-minded, your enemy... The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Look, David is responsible. You and I are responsible. But you have an enemy that you cannot see. And he wants to ruin your life. Jesus wants to give you life. We have to be followers of Jesus. We have to navigate our days in our moments with great wisdom and great awareness. Because if we don't, then our life is in jeopardy. We've got to be aware. We've got to be aware. Don't be fooled. All right, number two is get connected. Get connected. 
Um, David's alone when he makes the biggest, stupidest decisions of his life. He's all by himself. I don't know about you, but some of the stupidest decisions I've ever made was when I was alone, but I should have been around other people. Hebrews 10 says, And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Uh, the day approaching is just another way of saying, hey, look, uh, it's referring to this, this moment in history where Jesus comes back and, and brings his kingdom. But the, but the idea here is that Man, if you're disconnected now, it's going to be even more important tomorrow and more important the next day and more important the next day after that to get connected, to, to build real friendships, to be authentic and be like, hey, bro, I got a secret and I'm ashamed and I'm embarrassed, but I got to tell somebody or else the devil's going to ruin my life, right? The Bible says that when we confess our sins, this healing process where God brings us back to wholeness can actually begin, right? Secrecy just causes isolation and insecurity. We've got to be real. We've got to be authentic. Number three, and this is the last one. It's going to sound like something, but then I'll define it. Number three is start working. Start working, right? Some of you do need a job, like go out and get a job, but <laughs> it's not what it's saying. Some of you parents are like, my kid's 17 and he needs a job. Preach. Start working. Ephesians chapter 2. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Uh, it's not a foolproof plan, but if you are living a life of purpose, you're going to have less opportunity and less motivation to do stupid stuff. Yeah. Right? So are you living a life of purpose? Be alert. Get connected. Get connected. You have a response card on here. Jessica's going to talk about it here in a minute. But if you, are, if, you are, if you are disconnected, if you're isolated, or you know you need people in your life to help you grow in your faith, you need to fill that thing out and you need to say, I want to join a growth group. We're going to be launching those in January and February and you need to be in one. And then thirdly, Start working. Start discerning your purpose. Start listening and quieting your heart so that you can hear God's direction in your life. So that you can take action and do the things that God wants you to do. David was not working. He was not working. Um, shortly after the uh, pots and pans Christmas... Uh, my wife and I got news that our friend Justin was having an affair with a woman at work. And when his guilt became too much for him to bear on his own, he shared the news with his wife and then left. And of course, where did he go? He reconnects with his mistress and he stayed the night at her house thinking that his marriage was over and that his sin had ruined his family, and his life. Justin finally came to his sentence, senses. Uh, the, uh, you know, where, where's Jose? We need beautiful music playing behind this story. <laughs> Justin finally figured out, man, I am blowing it. I'm blowing up my life. And over the next several months, uh, he stayed at our house where he turned in his phone every single day. Uh, he went to counseling several times a week. And though he was older, we were creating a chore list for him. I mean, it was a humiliating experience for a grown man. From there, Justin and JC, they would fight for their marriage. They would take baby steps toward rebuilding their relationship and begin establishing a brand new level of trust between the two of them. They started dating again, and finally, with the help of their counselor and a few pastors and, of course, some friends, my wife and I and, and, uh, and some others, Justin was able to move back 
with his wife and his two small children. <sighs> two years later, Justin and JC, they uh, renewed their vows on their 10th wedding anniversary in front of 100 of their closest friends and family. I don't know what sin you're carrying in your life, but there is hope. There is hope. God wants to meet you there, right in the middle of the mess. Don't try to clean yourself up before you go to God. God is not scared. He's not offended. He's not insecure. He's not weak. He loves you and he wants to meet you there. And he wants to help clean up your life so that you look and experience Jesus. Would you meet him there? Man. I don't even know how to end the sermon. It's heavy. It's heavy. Some of you are feeling the weight of the world on your shoulders, but I just want you to know there is hope. Be encouraged and take responsibility. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Some of you, you're in here and you've never given your uh, life to Christ. You've never heard this message before. You thought God was angry at you. You thought that God turned his back on you. And today you realize, man, God is right here with you and he wants to forgive your sin and invite you into a brand new relationship with him. Today, I want to invite you into that relationship, and all you have to do is confess your sins to God and believe that Jesus Christ lived, died, and rose again on your behalf. So if that's you this morning, I simply want you to raise your hand on the count of three. I want to step into a relationship with God this morning. On the count of three, if that's you, raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise it up. Raise it up. Raise it up. Hmm. Hmm. I want all of you to stand. We're going to pray together. If you're in here, man. <laughs> and you know you have some work to do with God. Or maybe you have some work to do in your relationship with someone. Or you have a secret to expose. Um, I want to pray for you. Okay? I want to pray for you. Father, would you meet us in our mess? Would you meet us in our sin? Would you give us the courage and the strength we need to take responsibility and do what it takes to be reconciled in our relationships with people and in our relationship with you, God? We love you. We love you. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated.